ministry. Now listen, we've been are you excited for the word this morning. Listen, listen, we've been, we've been, we, we, we started two weeks ago going through Ephesians, and like I told you, we're going to go through Ephesians like a Hispanic eats chicken. We're going to tear that thing apart, we're going to eat all the, we're going to take it all the way down to the marrow. You know how you, you get to the cartilage and the marrow. We're, we're going to go through Ephesians like that. So it's going to take a, it's taking a while. We're still in chapter one. Pastor G's going to come up right now, and he's going to finish chapter one for me. But listen, if you haven't, if you haven't heard the first two, I, I really think it's important that, that, you, that you listen to them online, download them, podcast, join the podcast. You can um, listen to it online. Really, I want you to be able to go through Ephesians with the church and be built up. Like, like if you took, like get your college credits, amen? Amen? Like, like get, that in, get that in you and get that under your belt. So, so if you've missed the last two, just go online, sanctuaryfellowship.org. Listen to it. It's free. Just, you know, get it on your podcast and listen to it so that we can move forward knowing that we've gone through a full book of the Bible this year. Amen? All right. So get excited. Lean in. Come on. Amen. Before I start, I was doing some research because I know that some of you here, you're trying to live a healthy lifestyle. So I did some research on, on what are the right things to eat. So here's what I found out. The Japanese eat very little fat and suffer few heart, fewer heart attacks than the English. The Mexicans eat a lot of fat and suffer fewer heart attacks than the English. The Japanese drink very little red wine and suffer fewer heart attacks than the English. The Italians drink a lot of red wine and suffer fewer heart attacks than the English. The Germans drink a lot of beer and eat a lot of sausage and fat and suffer fewer heart attacks than the English. So here's the conclusion they came up with. Eat and drink whatever you want. Apparently it's speaking English that kills you. <laughs> that, that's for all of you health people out there. People tell me not to eat too many preservatives, but at my age I need all the preservatives I could get. So I'm going to be continuing um, Pastor George's series on the book of Ephesians. So I'm going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 13. And these first verses, I'm going to read from a new version of the Bible called the Passion Translation, which I really like. It says, And because of him, speaking of Jesus, when you who are not Jews heard the revelation of truth, you believed in the wonderful news of salvation. Now we have been stamped with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. He is given to us like an engagement ring is given to a bride as the first installment of what's coming. He is our hope promise of a future inheritance which seals us until we have all of redemption's promises and experience complete freedom, all for the supreme glory and honor of God. So to start off with, I'm going to teach you a theological term that, that would be good for you to know, and it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If That means that if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that God himself, God the Holy Spirit, has come to live inside of you. You, you, are, you have made, your body is a home for the Spirit of God. You see, God himself is in you. You carry the power, the presence, and the wisdom of God on the inside. That means that you lost the excuse of saying, I'm only human, because God in you makes you superhuman. So everyone's impressed with all these superheroes when you yourself got the God of the universe. You carry him around, realms of glory everywhere that you go. 
And it says that the Holy Spirit is God's seal or down payment or engagement ring of your future inheritance as a child of God. The Holy Spirit that you carry is, is a sign of God's promise of your future inheritance. What is your future inheritance? Maybe you don't have any relatives that are going to leave you anything. What kind of future inheritance do we have? Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 2.9 that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. You see, God has great blessings for you here in earth as you live your life here. He has plans to bless you, to do, for you to do great things on the earth. But this world, it's saying, is not your final end. This is not your final home. God has treasures for you forever and ever. And you could know that that's you. How do you know? Because you know you got the Spirit of God in you. You know that when you're about to say something you shouldn't say. How many of you get that voice right in your head? No, you be quiet. No, don't do that. How many of you sometimes when you're worshiping, all of a sudden, it might not happen all the time, but every now and then, all of a sudden, the presence of God just begins to touch you. Anybody here? That means you got the Spirit of God living in you. That Holy Spirit helps you here on earth, but it's also a deposit of the future promise that you're going to be in eternity with God forever and ever, that even if you died today, that you would go right into the glory realms of heaven. You, you see, my wife who died just a few months ago, I believe that right now, because she had the Spirit of God in her, that she's in a place of no more pain, no more tears, no more suffering, that she lives in the presence of God in a place of abundance, every need overflowingly provided. There is no lack in heaven, no more death in heaven. That's your inheritance forever and ever and ever. And while she was here on earth, through all the pain and the suffering and the difficulties, she had no doubt of where she would go after this life because the Spirit of God in her gave her peace, gave her comfort, gave her assurance. And she knew that that same Holy Spirit at the moment of death would carry her right into the arms of her Savior. You see, there's a lot of things that I enjoy in this world. God created the world for us to enjoy, but I don't live anymore for those pleasures. Paul said in Philippians 3.14, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Paul wasn't saying, I don't care about this world. I don't care about people. Let's just get out of here. I'm not going to do anything. This world is not my home. Paul was saying, I have times of joy in this world. There's people I love deeply. Um, my life is making a difference. But my eyes are not on the pleasures, not on the treasures down here, the riches that are passing away. But Paul said, my eyes are on the treasures and the glory that God has stored up with, for me. Our destiny is not for this world alone, or we would be, Paul said, we would be sorry people if this is all there is. But the Holy Spirit is given as an engagement ring that one day we're going to be in the presence of Jesus. And we're going to belong to him forever and ever throughout all eternity. All 
the suffering gone. So I'm going to go down now to verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly place places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. See, Paul prayed first that the eyes of their understanding be enlightened. See, the, Bi the Bible teaches that you can have physical eyes. You could see this pulpit here. You could see the people around you, but you could be spiritually blinded. Jesus told his disciples in Mark 8, 18, Do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? In other words, a person can sit in church every week, hear the message, and it won't impact their lives because their eyes are spiritually blinded. You could hear the word. You could stand in the presence, sing the songs, and, and if your eyes are shut to the spiritual thing, it won't make any impact in your life. You see, there are different types of eyes other than our physical eyes that we could see the world through. We have the eyes of our past. Those of you who came from an abusive background, you might see yourself as worthless and others as untrustworthy. If we look at the world through eyes of pain and disappointment, everything is another potential hurt. Every person is a potential rejection. See, we can look through the eyes of the past. We can look through the eyes of religious hypocrisy. Those are people who see themselves as clean and pure and holy and point fingers at everyone else as a dirty sinner. Oh, how bad your sins can look when they're committed by somebody else. We can also look through the eyes of the culture that we live in. And very often, the values of our culture are the exact opposite of God's truth. In our culture, for example, people are given a value and worth according to how much money they make, what country they came from, their appearance, how many t followers do they have on Twitter. That's not the kingdom of God. That's not the values that God upholds. God looks at you, and he sees that you are created in his image. He looks at you through eyes of love. You can't look at yourself through the eyes of this culture that sees people as worthless because they don't fit in. You are beautiful in the kingdom of God. The culture tells us that it's okay to live however you want as long as you don't hurt anybody else. If I look through those eyes, you can destroy your family. I've seen homes, marriages, and even churches destroyed by hidden sin and rebellion against God's way. And when you tell people, I'm not hurting anybody, your kids are watching you. 
It matters how you live, how you treat people. You see, this culture denigrates marriage. You know what people tell me? Oh, it's just a piece of paper. I, I don't need that piece of paper to show my love. That's not just a piece of paper. That's an eternal vow and commitment before God to love that person, to lay down their, your life for them. Every now and then a man will come to me and talk about his girlfriend and refer to her as his wife. I say, your wife, you single woman, if you don't have a ring in your finger and that man is not committed to love you through poverty and sickness, to sit in hospital rooms, if he's not committed to die for you, he, you are not his wife. Those are the eyes of this world, the eyes of this culture. That's not what marriage is. That man is not your husband. If, if he's not willing to stick with you, no matter what, for all, right up until the last day, till death do us part, that ring matters. The piece of paper matters. I could go on and on about the culture, but I want to get to the main point. We have also what the scripture called the eyes of our understanding, which is our spiritual eyes. Because, as I said, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, we have the ability to see the world, ourselves, and others from God's perspective. Through eyes of faith, hope, love, grace, and compassion. I, I want to reread from verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. You see, I see the world through a God who is far greater than every, any devil, far greater than any evil power, any evil thing that tries to come against me. He has dominion. He sits enthroned high above the universe. Nothing can stand against you. The question is, can we see it? Sometimes people get freaked out. Oh, these witches just moved into the next apartment and they're chanting, they're doing spells. Oh, this is terrible. They're pro I ain't afraid of no witches. What eyes are you looking at? There's no evil that could stand in your way. If you could see God high and lifted up, seated on the throne, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's greater than your problems and difficulties and hardships. Many of you know the story of David. He looked into the eyes of the giant Goliath. Now everyone else around him saw Goliath, and they said, that guy, he's too tough. We can't beat him, and they all ran. The Bible said they hid in caves. We can't face that giant. That's what happens when you don't have spiritual eyes. You see a giant and you run. We're not called as God's people to run from mere giants, mere men. David, he looked into the eyes of the giant. He said, you come against me with swords and clubs, but I come against you in the name of the God of the armies of Israel. How many of us can look into the eyes of a giant and see God about to rise up and strike? 
What, what are those giants, those bills that we can't pay, the broken relationship, the troubles in marriage that seem so big and so hard, the financial difficulties that seem overwhelming and keep us up at night? I, I personally have spent so many sleepless nights that was all for nothing because I didn't see God through the right eyes. I looked at him through the eyes of my emotions. We got to see God to spiritualize. He is more than enough in your life. You could look at that giant. You could go home today, see that stack of bills, and you Proclaim to those bills, my God is greater. He's my provider. He's a God of prosperity and abundance. He will supply every need. See, as God's people, it matters how we see things. There was a story in Numbers chapter 1. Where Moses, remember the Israelites were wandering through the desert. It was almost 40 years. And God said, God said, it's time to go to the promised land. So God told Moses to send out 12 spies. You go into the promised land and you go check it out and tell us what you see. The first 10 spies, they came back with a bad report. They said, we saw giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so were we in their sight. They went into the land, and the land was filled with riches, prosperity, anything that you would ever want. All God's blessing and abundance. But they said, we can't take that land. When we saw the giants, these are big giant warriors. When we saw them, we, we looked at ourselves as grasshoppers. And they see us as grasshoppers. You know that you are not a grasshopper? You are not insignificant? And you need to stop looking at yourself in that way. You are not a nobody. You got the power of God in you. You are a carrier of the very heavens of all of glory. The fullness of God living in you. When you look into the mirror... You need to begin to see yourself through God's eyes. You don't proclaim, oh, like someone else, Mephibosheth in the Bible. He said, I'm nobody. I'm just a dead dog. That's not you. You are beloved. The scripture says, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, there's nothing that you can't do. You are an overcomer. You are great in this world. You are a champion. Just, just to steal something from Pastor George's sermon from Ephesians 2, it says you are God's masterpiece. How many of you see yourself that way? It's not being humble. If I walk around tearing myself, I'm just so nobody, I'm nothing, I'm so humble. I don't care who walks through that door, what movie star, what, what rap artist, what famous preacher. You can walk right up to them, shake their hand, and look them right in the eye. Because they might be great, but you're great too. <laughs> the other two spies, Joshua and Caleb, they saw the same giants. They saw the same powerful warriors that, that looked like they could beat them up. But what they looked through the eyes of the Spirit, 
through the eyes of their understanding. And they said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. You need to get this in your head. You can overcome that situation you're facing. It doesn't matter how big or how large. God is bigger. He's more powerful. He's greater. In Ezekiel chapter 37, there was a prophet named Ezekiel. And God showed him a valley full of dead, dried out bones. And he asked Ezekiel, tell me what you see. And Ezekiel said, I see a valley of dead, dry bones. Now God told him, now look again. Look at that valley again. But this time you look through the eyes of the Spirit. This time you look through your Father's eyes. And this time he looked again. He saw the dry bones, but he proclaimed, I see a mighty army rising up. You see, I've looked into the eyes of a lot of, a lot of people who, who look broken and beaten up and nothing left. And I can see the power of God. I can see destiny. I can see God's plan. I, I could see their potential. If I look through the eyes of God, prophecy is not looking at a, at a broken person and telling them how messed up they are. That, that's not a prophetic word for those of you who are into the prophetic. Anyone, anyone who's told you, oh, you, you're just messed up. A prophetic word is, is looking into dry bones and seeing life and calling it out. So I just call that out of you right now. I pull out the greatness in you. I pull the glory realm out of you. Everything in you that's died, every dream, every hope, every, every emotion, every place of passion and excitement that's died in you, I speak life right now in Jesus' name. Jesus. In the New Testament, he looked into the eyes of broken, lost sinners. He didn't just tell them they're lost. He, he didn't look into the eyes of failures, people beaten down and looked down on by the religious people. He looked into their eyes. And he saw apostles and pastors and missionaries and prophets, businessmen. He also looked into the eyes of proud religious leaders and saw spiritual death and fake religion. See, God could keep you from getting hooked up with the wrong person if you look at them through the eyes of the Spirit. There's been many times in the past in ministry where I hooked up with the wrong people because I looked at them through my natural eyes. I was impressed by their Bible knowledge. I was impressed by their gifts, by their outward appearance. But I didn't look by spiritual eyes into the heart of the person. There's a word for that in the Bible. It's called discernment. You need to know people. The Bible says we know them by the Spirit. You see, here's a quote from T.D. Jakes. He said, if you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. But you got to see it. You got to see Jesus on his throne. There's nothing that can hold you back. Nothing can stop you. But if you can't see it, it isn't going to happen. You got to take hold of these messages, these words. 
Pastor George takes hours of preparation to do these messages. We can't look through blind eyes and then go home and that message did nothing for us. Oh, that was a nice time in the Lord. To, oh, good message, Pastor George. And then go home and not put to practice the words that were spoken. We got to look to spiritual life. If you want to be an overcomer, if you want to be all that God called you to be, you got to get rid of, the, rid of the eyes of this world, the eyes of this culture, and see the world through the eyes of your heavenly Father. Eyes of mercy, eyes of love, eyes of grace, eyes of power. You see, just to give a short testimony, because of how I grew up, my tendency is always to imagine the worst possible outcome in every difficult situation. That's my first impulse. If somebody's a half hour late, right away I envision in my mind a major traffic accident where everything's wrecked, people are hurt. Well, soon, right, right just a short time after my wife passed away, I was telling Jessica Vasquez, our crack, our crack real estate agent, see, I gave you a plug. I said, well, I guess we bet you better get ready to put my home on the market because now I'm not going to have the money. I'm not going to be able to stay here because those I was looking through the wrong eyes. Eyes of lack, eyes of poverty, eyes of never having enough. Well, I guess this is it. Well, two weeks ago, I found out that God is more than enough. He's everything he said he is, and I'm able to stay in my home. God, God is restoring back financially everything that's been lost. He's greater than my fears. He's greater than every worry, any debt that you have. He's bigger still. And he is the head of the church. And it says the fullness of his presence fills the church. What is the church? That's you. It's not about a building. That's what I used to think years ago. I used to go running everywhere because I thought this building over there, that one's special. If you want to meet God, you better go down to that building. Until I found out it's not about a building, it's about God's people carrying his presence into your job, into your home, your school. I'm going to ask Lee to come. Lee's going to come right now and testify. You know, I can certainly attest to people making one feel like a grasshopper. And there's something about when Pastor Gary just said that, that just kind of just put a stamp on everything that I want to share with you. Like he was saying, never let anyone make you feel like you less than. Never let anyone cause you to shrink back and not be everything that you were fully created to be. A very long time ago, before I got saved, I've shared this with you guys before, but... I got saved because I was in the music industry. And when I got saved, the Lord spoke to me very, very clearly. And he said, I don't want you part of that world. He said, I want you to come out from that. And I want to teach you how to sing for me. So I was like, all right, Lord. He said, I'll, I'll, I promise you. His promise to me was that, you know, that he would fulfill a longing in my heart to sing. But it would be done a different way. Not in a way where I would have to try to open up doors for myself and provide the right opportunities and compromise my integrity for the opportunity to sing, right? So 
As I grew in the Lord, he began to open up doors for me to sing, like, in different churches, on worship teams. And, you know, I was like, wow, God, you know, you're really, like, fulfilling what you told me. And this is beautiful. And, you know, everybody looks for success and progression. And in the Lord, that's okay, right? Because if God has shown you something, he will take you from one glory to the next glory to the next glory in that promise, right? So I'm standing steadfast because I could have went back into the world. I, I had still had connections, still people I spoke to that, you know, worked in the industry, but I, I would make, I had a steadfast resolve in me, and I set my mind and my heart like flint before him and the promise that he set before me, and I was like, no, you know, I want to sing for Jesus, and I don't want to compromise that. Well, several years ago, it's probably close, closer now to a decade ago, I was in a church um, that was very, very popular and is known around the world, and my husband and I helped um, this church to be planted in New York City. Now, out in L.A., there was another church they had that was well-established, and one of the senior pastors was the pastor of a very famous um, evangelist that most of you probably watch on TV. And so I, when I got to this church, the Lord started to open up doors, and this pastor had come to me and asked me to write a book, and they are a published author themselves, and I was so excited, and I took six months um, to sit down and write my, to write my testimony out. And, you know, while I was doing this, I was also on the worship team. Now, on this worship team, um, on, in this church, they had a record label, a Christian record label that was connected to a major record label, right? And so they were very selective about who they chose to be on this worship team because they had to sort of, uh, you know, if you know anything about the music industry, they had to stay according to, like, the brand that they were creating, right? And so... They asked me to be a part of this worship team, but oftentimes they would shut off my mic and they wouldn't let me sing. And it was very confusing for me, but I wasn't the only one that they did this to, right? They did this to several people. And a couple of the people, like in the middle of rehearsals, kind of called them out in a very ungodly way and was like, oh, you think you so-and-so just because you got a record label? Oh, you think I'm going to show up to these rehearsals and I'm going to let you shut my mic up and I, my mic off and I got a gift and if you don't want to use it, well then... I'm out. And I had these experiences, and I was like, should I do that? Like, because I'm being played right now, so what should I do? Because, like, in the world, I would never let no one play me like that, but I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? Like, you know? And I felt the Holy Spirit just say, just be still. Hold your peace, and let me fight in the unseen for you. I'm going to work according to my plan for you, but I couldn't see nothing. So I was like, but, like, I feel like I'm being played. I feel like my dreams are being annihilated. I feel like I'm in a place where maybe I could really grow, and maybe this is what God wants. Maybe he's going to prosper me in this. Well, so I stood still, and I continued to worship with my mic off. And I'll never forget one day someone came over to me after the service, and they were like, girl, you bless me with your worship. And I was looking at them, like, all confused because I'm like, my mic is off. What are they talking about? I didn't tell this to this person because, you know, Love covers a multitude of sin. So I didn't want to shout out the leadership and the people who were over the worship ministry. And I didn't want to be like, well, you know that they shut off my mic. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go there. I could have. I had a choice to make, but I didn't do it. So I was like, wow, really? Thank you. They were like, yeah, when I just watch you, when I just watch you worship, it blesses me. And I was like, you know what? Confirmation. All right, I'm going to stay right where I am. Well, one day we were switching locations and our, we were functioning out of like a house. It was kind of like a house church and then we got established and we were downtown in Manhattan and our services were being housed in a very popular Christian television station studio. And so the very first time that we were going to gather, um, some of the pastors from LA were getting ready to um, visit our service that night and the pastor out in LA had said to me, hey, I'm going to like announce that you wrote this book and so um, we're going to do like a whole thing and like I really like for you to sing that night and he didn't know because this pastor was overseeing out from the west coast so he didn't know my mic was being shut off and he came to me and he's like, hey, so you know, could you sing like that song and I'm like, okay, cool, yeah, I'll do it. And I was like, wow, God, like, you know, and I felt like satisfied right there, like redemption. Yes, God, you have my back. I'm doing it, right? As it, but we don't know what's going on in the unseen. We don't know the vindication that God has. We don't understand that God is setting a table in the presence of our enemies just so that he could show himself off. 
So I show up to church that night, which again was in a very popular television station studio, Christian TV station studio. And they announced that I'm writing this book, and I'm like, wow, that's so cool, like, you know. And I get up on stage, and I sing my song, and I just sing it with everything I got, right? I'm singing on a mic that CeCe Winans had sang on, and I was like, oh, my God, like, vindication, right? Thinking, like, this was it. God did his thing. Well, after the service, just so happened that the owner of the station His son, who was also at that time part owner of the television station, was sitting in the audience unbeknown to me. And so he came over to me after the service and he said, and I recognized him immediately because he had frequently made appearances on this television station. And he came over to me and he said, wow, you know, I just want you to know that, like, you really blessed me. Like, you really, like, that worship, it was beautiful. And I was like, oh, thank you. Like, wow, okay, yeah, thank you. And he's like, I'm just wondering, would, would you be interested in, like, coming on this very popular television show that they had on the station. He's like, would you be interested in coming on the show and being like our featured singer for the evening for this show? And I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, I would love for you to like just come in. You'll be our featured singer. You sing two songs. And just so that you know, it's aired all around the world to millions of people. I was like, what? I was like, okay, I'll do it. I mean, fearful as all get out. But I was like, all right, I'll do it. And then a couple days later, the people who had shut my mic off, they saw him talking to me. So they were like, why are you still going to hurt? Right? Because these were the people that made me feel like I was a grasshopper. These were the people that if I would have fixed my eyes on what they were doing, I would never have gotten to the point where I, would, I could trust God to fulfill the thing that he had been calling me to do. So they came over and they were like, what was that about? And I was like, oh, you know. I played it cool. I was like, oh, you know, they just asked me to be on that show. He was like, what? I was like, yeah. And then they acted like it was no big thing, right? They were like, all right, cool. Still kept shutting my mic off. Then two days later, they were like, hey, you need anybody to play for you? You need anyone to back you up? You need anybody to? I was like, no, I'm good. I'm actually going to use tracks. I I, I, kind of wanted to play them and made them feel like I was being like that, but I really had to use tracks. So I was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. And then from that moment, after I did that show, someone else came to me, the son, now the grandson of the owner, came to me and said, hey, so I do this, like, teen show, it was on the same radio station, I mean, um, television station. He's like, so I'd really love for you to be, like, a feature, like, we want to feature you, like, we want to do your whole testimony, and we want you to sing, and we want to give you the entire show. I was like, what? Okay. Okay. So a few weeks later, I show up at the television station again, but I'll tell you this, because they fancy, right? So I had a dressing room, right? So I was in my dressing room, and I'm like, wow, God, look at what you've done. Look at what you did. Look at how you vindicated me to millions, in front of millions of people all around the world. They didn't know I was being vindicated while they were watching me sing on TV, but I knew what God was doing. And then I had this man come in, because sometimes we could think that once God does that thing, that that's it, that, that, that the buck stops there, and then you know, we good, and we can move right along. Well, I'll never forget, there was an evangelist on the show that night, and he was preaching. And when his segment was over, in between mine and his, he came into my dressing room, and he said, can I pray for you? I don't know this man from Adam. I don't know him. He walked in. He began to pray for me, and he began to say, don't let what your eyes see right now in front of you determine what's going to happen. He said, because I'm telling you, you haven't even begun to scratch the surface. You've only begun to scratch the surface of what God is about to do in and through you. This is not it. And it's not over. And I just fell to my face and I was like, Lord, have your way. Because what we don't understand is that there is an unseen world, is that there is something that's happening behind the scenes, behind the curtain that we don't understand. But yet, same in the still, we have a very real adversary that wants to use the lives of hurting people to try to destroy who we are. But you've got to know that God is faithful to the thing that he's called you to. And even though people may rise up to try to speak against you, and people may rise up and they may try to set themselves so that you may feel like a grasshopper, right? They might become like a giant in your land. But God is saying, but I'm going to set a table for you in the presence of your enemies so that I can be exalted. Not so that you can walk around and be like, yeah, look how good I look. No, it's not for that. 
so that even your enemy can see how much God loves. So that even those who stand against you, they can see that there is real vindication from the Holy Spirit. Amen? And I want you to know this morning that God is doing something that you cannot see. The same way that God did it for David. The same way that God did it for Elijah. The same way that God did it for Paul. The same way that God did it for Peter. God is working out a good plan so that you might know that he is for you and not against you. That thing he promised you is going to come to pass. But we have to, like I was saying earlier in Colossians, we've got to fix our eyes. We've got to set our hearts and set our minds to see things that are above. To set our eyes on the work of Christ to say, I'm not going to look what's happening in front of me. I'm going to set my eyes to the spirit. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to react when something doesn't go my way. I'm not going to react when people do me wrong. I'm not going to do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because God's got a better plan. God's got a better way of working that thing out for you so that he can be glorified. Amen? Can we rise to our feet for a moment? I'm going to ask Nathaniel to come up. I just want to sing something over you. Because I really believe that God wants to open the eyes of your understanding. Amen. Why don't we just close our eyes? Why don't we just close our eyes for a moment? <coughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. We give you praise. Open our eyes, God. Open our eyes to the unseen, Jesus. I want to declare something over you. And then Nathaniel's going to start to play. Chains be broken. Lives be healed. Eyes be opened. Christ is revealed. I'm going to sing that one more time over you. Chains be broken, lives be healed, eyes be opened, Christ is revealed. <coughs> <coughs>
And I just want to pray. See, I, I've struggled with that my whole life, that grasshopper syndrome. Often feeling like a nobody. Inconsequential. I don't matter. Until I learned to begin to see myself through the eyes of a Savior who loves with a powerful, everlasting love everlasting love. My value comes from him. I couldn't see that. Anyone else here beside me struggle with that? Just where you're at, if you raise your hand, I'll just pray for you right now. Father, I just pray right now, God, over each one whose hand is raised, Father, I thank you that they are not a nothing, Lord God, but that they matter to you, God. They are powerful. They are meaningful in your sight. You have made them worthy, Lord God. I break off every word that's been spoken against you in your life, telling you you're nothing. You'll never be anybody. Who do you think you are? I break those words right now in Jesus' name. And I release to you eyes that can see the love of a Savior. The depth, the Bible says, oh, how great is the depth, the width, the height of his love. It's unimaginable. The human mind can't see it. I bless you right now with that knowledge as we worship God in closing. Yes. Just stay in the spirit. Open the eyes of my heart. 
Cannot afford to forget the feeling of your arms, they hold me. The power of your skin is lovely. You provoke a man to bow down. I get on my knees and cry out everything I have. Everything we hope to be is in you. So, Father, we don't have to search because you've always been right in front. You've always been the answer. So, Father, we surrender today, this day, ourselves before you and ask that you would just take over, take control, Lord. Lord, in the areas, Father, where we may feel like we've been defeated, take control, Lord. In the areas where people might have spoken down, Father, take control. You work in the background. You are always at play. You never stop until your glory is revealed, oh God. So, Father, we trust you. We believe you. day, Lord, and we leave this place much more encouraged than we came in, oh God, knowing that you would speak right to our hearts, 
that you would bring a message so personal, oh God, to those that may be struggling today. And that you would speak a personal message to those who need to be strengthened today. So Father, we love you. We trust you. You are all that we've ever wanted. You have all that we've ever needed. Have your way in our lives. I just want to say you guys are blessed to be a blessing. Have a wonderful week. Bless you.